I'm a 33-year-old female, and I went to a convention with two female friends. We stayed in a downtown area hotel near the convention center. Caddy corner from our hotel was a chain drugstore. It was still light outside when we decided to get some snacks to eat while watching some Netflix that night. While my friends were looking at the candy, I stood back because I wanted chips, and I had noticed a man next to them. He wasn't looking at the candy. He was watching them. They hadn't noticed. So when they picked their candy, I whispered to them to follow me. I picked up the pace, turned quickly down the middle and down an aisle. I told them there's a creepy guy here and to stay together. That's when I noticed he's on the other end of the aisle. We kept taking turns down various aisles and he was following us. I strategically walked where he was in between us and the exit. At this time, we were basically trapped at the back of the store near the pharmacy. The line for the pharmacy was long but full of men. So we got in line and started talking to the men in front of us, hoping it would scare off our stalker. We could still see him in the big glow mirror one aisle down, waiting for us. We waited in line for 30 minutes to ask for security. The security swept the pharmacy, and luckily, the stalker guy had left. We were extra careful when the security guard offered to walk us back to the front of our hotel. I don't know what intentions that guy had for us, but I'm glad I'll never find out. Hey y'all, this took place during the summer of 2022, and I just never thought of writing down this story because I was just so stunned that it even happened to me. So every summer in my city, my friends and I like to make small campfires and chilling in secluded areas, mainly because we don't want to drive an hour to an actual campsite and pay a campsite fee. These gatherings are usually spontaneous and make for a nice last minute hangout. There's this one spot near my house by a river that's really nice because hardly anyone goes there. The only thing to be worried about are bears though because living in the Pacific Northwest has its challenges. My house is located right next to mountains and forests. One particular night at 11 p.m., I decided to go ahead of my friends and meet them at the spot to set things up early. I wanted us to be all set up and ready once they arrived. The spot I had in mind required a two-minute paved walkway and a small trail ramping down the right side of the bridge that crosses over the river. Along this paved walkway, there are two lamps located halfway and another at the start of the bridge and the ramp leading to the campfire spot. I parked my car at the beginning of the trail on the street and brought my campfire essentials. Flashlight, lighter, small firewood, a small shovel for digging out the pit, and more. When I reached the spot, it was a small, sandy, beach-like embankment by the side of the river, with a small waiting area for toddlers and their families during hot summers. I set up a chair and started digging the pit with only my flashlight illuminating the area. I was shoveling sand right next to me, nowhere near the water. But suddenly, I heard a loud splash. It was so loud that it could only come from something equally large, like a two-pound-sized rock. I was confused because I swore I wasn't throwing sand into the water, even though I was only a few feet away. I shone my flashlight at the water, but I didn't see anything, so I brushed it off, thinking I was just hearing things. However, as I continued digging, I heard another loud splash. At this point, I thought something might be falling from above. As logically, something must be causing these splashes. I pointed my flashlight above, where some trees hung over the river, but I didn't see anything big enough to make such a splash. As I kept digging, with my heart rate now elevated, 
heard a rustling past the arch of the bridge that went over the river, I quickly grabbed my light and shone it toward the source of the rustling. I called out a hello, but there was no response. In my head, I knew that if it was a bear, I should be getting out of there immediately. But I saw no bear or any signs of anything for that matter. I tried to reassure myself that I was just hearing things, but then I heard the noise again. It was unmistakably the sound of leaves being rustled. I aimed my flashlight at the same area once more, focusing my eyes intently. Illuminated area. I saw the naked back of a man hunched over. I was frozen in anxiety and stress because honestly, of all the things I expected to encounter, I didn't think I'd see the back of a naked man. After a quick analysis, my brain managed to deduce that he looked to be in his mid-forties, with a shaved head, but not completely bald, and a medium-ish build, somewhere between chubby and muscular. As I kept my flashlight on his back, he started to stand up, and the first thing I noticed was that he wasn't wearing any pants either. My immediate reflex was to start packing up all my belongings and get out of there as I began to piece together that he must have been throwing things into the water to scare me or drive me away. Using my reflexive deductive skills, I proceeded to walk out of there with all my stuff, carrying it as I briskly walked up the small ramp and onto the paved path out of the forest. My heart was pounding in my chest and I frequently looked back to make sure I wasn't being followed. I was wearing Crocs, hoping that if I had to run, I wouldn't regret not being in sportier footwear. I made it to the halfway point, and a sense of relief started settling in, knowing I had made it safely out of this terrifying situation. But as I checked behind me for the final time, I saw something slowly creeping over the ramp. It was the naked man, crawling on all fours as if he were a primate. His head was positioned towards me, looking right at me as he made his way to the middle of the paved walkway. He slowly got up from his stance and started standing on his feet, positioning his body to face me. After settling into this new position, the man started running towards me. I freaked out and booked it, running as hard as I could down the path. My flashlight fell out of my pocket, and I lost it. But I didn't care, because a completely naked man was chasing me at 11 p.m. in a secluded forest. I looked back for a split second, and the man was still running towards me, still completely naked. He could have my flashlight for all I cared. I just wanted to make it out of the situation alive. Finally, I made it out of the forest and ran to my car, which was only about 30 feet away from the edge of the forest. I fumbled with my key fob to unlock the car, even dropping my keys at one point. In that moment, I thought, I might actually be done for. But I quickly brushed that thought aside, picked up my keys, and unlocked the car. I managed to get my key properly into the ignition, switched my sights to the road in front of me, and zoomed out of the area as fast as possible. I drove away, putting a good 30 seconds between myself and the horrifying encounter. As I was leaving the location, my phone rang, and it was my friends calling, asking if I had made it to the spot yet. All I could say to them was, Guys, do I have a crazy story to tell you? They pulled up to my house, which was actually quite close to the campfire area, and I recounted the entire story, just as I've told it here. They all swore that none of them were trying to prank me, and they had nothing to do with what I experienced. I knew none of them would sprint at me in the dark, completely naked, while we were talking in front of my house, a college student who appeared to be walking home in the direction 
of where I encountered the naked man caught my attention. I called out to him, hey, be careful. There was some naked guy chasing me by the bridge that crosses over the river. So be careful, man. He responded with a surprised, oh damn, really? I have to go over that bridge to get home. All I could tell him was, well, good luck, man. The next day, I reported the incident to the police over the phone, and they sent an officer to meet with me in person. I showed them where I had initially seen the man's back hunched over. When we returned to the area, they said they didn't find any traces of anyone being there previously. Nevertheless, the officer said they would make a note of it just in case it happened again. Some of my friends speculated about what it could have been. Some mentioned the idea of a skinwalker, while others thought it was more likely a homeless, mentally ill, or intoxicated person. One theory I've heard from my friends, in a more lighthearted manner, is that it could have been a future version of me pulling a prank on a past version of me. Honestly, if time travel were real, I could totally see myself messing with my younger self like that. That's pretty much my only let's not meet story, but it's a tale I'll never forget. This incident happened around three years ago, right around the time that COVID-19 started. So it's been a while, but it's still a story worth sharing. It was early 2020 and I had just gotten a new job in a small town near my area while looking for a place to live. My sister offered to rent her house to me. She had bought the house two years prior, but she and her husband didn't really take to it. And their commute to work was long, so they moved out, leaving the house unoccupied. Luckily for me, it was relatively close to my workplace, just a four minute drive away, and my sister pretty much rented it to me for free. I only had to cover the water and electricity bills and take care of the house. I had been living there for a solid two or three months and had already gotten used to it. One night, after returning from work and parking my car, as I walked towards my front door, I noticed something odd. There was a cigarette butt on the curb near my house. I leaned down to pick it up, thinking it might have been mine since I'm a smoker. However, upon examining the brand name, I realized it wasn't mine and discarded it. I didn't think much of it at the time, just shrugged it off as someone randomly tossing it near my curb. I went on with my night and nothing unusual happened. Two days later, as I was once again walking to my house, I spotted a few more cigarette butts, this time near my porch. Needless to say, I was annoyed. I thought that someone had sat on my porch and smoked. I now noticed that they were put out fairly recently. So whoever it was probably walked off as I was approaching. That night, I was watching a movie on my laptop and it was pretty late past 1 a.m. I was surprised when I heard a car passing by. It was a suburban neighborhood and it was quiet at night, so people rarely ventured out, but I didn't think much about it. About half an hour later, I was startled by the sound of shattering glass nearby. I listened intently, but I couldn't make out what they were saying as their voices seemed muffled and quiet. By this point, I was getting a bit unnerved, so I stopped the movie and quietly got off my sofa. I walked to the front door to make sure it was locked. As I approached the door, I froze mid-step when I heard two people approaching my porch and reducing their conversation to a whisper. It was clear to me that whoever these individuals were, they wanted to break in. I leaned against my door and waited expecting to hear a loud bang or the doorknob being shaken. However, it was oddly quiet. I decided to walk over to my window to see if they had walked away or changed their minds. 
My windows had bars from the inside out that needed to be unlocked to move the curtains or look outside comfortably. Slowly, I unlocked the bar mechanism and lifted it up. I moved the curtain and was taken aback by what I saw. Leaning against my window was a man. He was just as startled as I was, and he stumbled over his own steps as he jumped back from the window. Individuals of doing so, one evening, he knocked on my door and claimed that I was responsible for the dust on his car, even though I had nothing to do with it. I tried to explain that it was ash from the wildfires, but he wouldn't listen and became increasingly agitated. David's behavior became more concerning over time. He would often talk to himself loudly in the hallway, sometimes shouting profanities and threats. He would pace back and forth outside his apartment for hours, and it was clear that he was becoming increasingly paranoid. One night, I heard him screaming in his apartment, and it sounded like he was arguing with someone, though I couldn't hear any other voices. I was genuinely concerned for his well-being and considered calling the police, but I didn't want to escalate the situation further. Things took a darker turn one evening when I returned home from work and found a disturbing note slipped under my door. The note was filled with ramblings about conspiracies and it accused me of being part of some plot against him. It was clear that David's mental state was deteriorating rapidly. I immediately reported the note to the building management, who informed me that they were aware of David's erratic behavior and had been trying to help him. They assured me that they were working to address the situation, but I couldn't shake the feeling of unease living across the hall from him. One night, as I was getting ready for bed, I heard loud banging noises coming from David's apartment. It sounded like he was smashing things against the walls. I was genuinely scared for my safety at this point and decided to spend the night at my parents' house. The next day, I returned to my apartment and was relieved to find that David had been removed from the building. The building management had finally taken action to ensure the safety of the residents. I never found out the full extent of David's mental health issues or what led to his erratic and paranoid behavior. All I knew was that living across the hall from him had been an unsettling and distressing experience. I was thankful that the building management took the necessary steps to address the situation and I could finally live in peace without the constant fear of what might happen next. This incident took place in the summer of 2023, and it served as a stark reminder of the importance of mental health awareness and support for those in need. Apartment building and several neighbors who normally didn't speak to each other were all hugging and crying, as well as showing each other videos of the SWAT team and police response on their phones. The incident had left our community in shock and disbelief. It was a traumatic experience for everyone involved, and the sense of security we once felt in our building was shattered. The fact that David had been displaying increasingly bizarre and erratic behavior leading up to this event made it all the more unsettling. In the aftermath, the apartment management faced significant criticism for not taking earlier action in response to residents' complaints about David's behavior. Many of us felt that the situation could have been prevented or de-escalated if they had taken our concerns more seriously. For me, the incident was a stark reminder of the importance of addressing mental health issues and providing support to those who are struggling. It also highlighted the need for better communication and collaboration among residents and building management to ensure the safety and well-being of everyone 
in the community. While the immediate danger had been eliminated, the emotional scars and trauma of that day lingered among the residents of the building. It served as a stark reminder that sometimes seemingly harmless or eccentric behavior can escalate into a serious threat if left unaddressed. As time passed, our community slowly began to heal and the apartment management implemented changes in their policies and procedures to ensure that such a tragedy would not happen again. However, the memory of that fateful day would forever be etched in our minds as a sobering reminder of the importance of vigilance and compassion in our interactions with others, especially those who may be in crisis. Rich guy to be tossing around cash like that. I didn't think much of it until he started making increasingly bizarre requests. He asked me to describe explicit fantasies, pretend I was in distress, and even send pictures of my feet. Each time, he promised more money, and I couldn't resist the temptation of the easy income. It was as if he had an endless supply of money to throw at me. As the requests became more disturbing, I began to feel uncomfortable and objectified. I didn't know much about this person, and the anonymity of the internet made it even more unsettling. I was earning good money, but at what cost to my own well-being? One day, he sent a request that crossed a line I couldn't ignore. He asked for a video of me engaging in self-harm, promising a substantial sum in return. That request shocked me to my core, and I couldn't believe what he was asking for. I refused, blocked him, and reported his account to OnlyFans. I also took a break from the platform to collect my thoughts and reflect on what had happened. I felt a mix of relief and guilt. Relief that I had finally severed ties with this person, but guilt for having gone along with some of his earlier requests for money. After some time away, I returned to OnlyFans with a different perspective. I realized that I needed to set boundaries and prioritize my own mental and emotional well-being over quick cash. I adjusted my content and made it clear in my profile what I was comfortable with and what I wasn't. Fortunately, I still had subscribers who appreciated my content within those boundaries. While I wasn't making as much money as before, I felt better about the work I was doing. The experience with the Creeper served as a stark reminder of the risks and challenges that come with online sex work. It highlighted the importance of maintaining personal boundaries and being cautious when interacting with anonymous individuals on the internet. I also learned that quick money often comes with hidden costs, and it's essential to prioritize one's mental health and safety over financial gain. While only fans can offer opportunities for income, it's crucial to approach it with caution and a clear understanding of your own boundaries. Unnecessary. And I started to focus on other aspects of my life, like getting to know the girl I had met through work. However, I couldn't shake the feeling of unease that had been growing ever since my interactions with the creeper. The possessiveness, invasive questions, and sudden disappearance had left me with a lingering sense of discomfort. One evening, as I was leaving work and heading home, I noticed a car following me. It was a dark sedan that seemed to be tailing me wherever I went. I became increasingly paranoid as I made turns and took detours to see if the car would continue to follow. It did. My heart raced, and I knew I couldn't go back to my apartment with this car following me. I decided to drive to the nearest police station hoping that the presence of law enforcement would deter the person following me. As I pulled into the police station parking lot, the dark
dark sedan hesitated for a moment and then sped away, disappearing into the traffic. I waited a while before leaving the police station and eventually made my way back home, taking a circuitous route to ensure I wasn't being followed. I couldn't help but connect the strange car following me to the creeper. It felt like more than just a coincidence. Had he discovered my real life identity and decided to stalk me? The fear and paranoia I felt were overwhelming. I decided to take further precautions. I deleted my OnlyFans account and all my associated social media profiles. I also filed a report with the police about the car that had followed me, though there was little they could do without more information. Over time, the fear subsided, but I remained cautious about my online presence. I realized the dangers of engaging with anonymous individuals on the internet and the potential risks involved in sharing personal information, even inadvertently. The experience served as a stark reminder of the importance of online privacy and personal safety. It taught me that easy money could come at a high price, and that sometimes it's better to prioritize one's safety and well-being over financial gain. As I moved forward, I focused on building a more secure and stable life for myself, one that didn't involve compromising my privacy or engaging with strangers in a way that made me feel uncomfortable or unsafe. Creeper the experience left me deeply unsettled and paranoid. It showed me the dark side of online interactions and the potential consequences of engaging with anonymous individuals. The Creeper's relentless pursuit and harassment made me realize that online safety and privacy are paramount. I took steps to protect myself, including deleting my OnlyFans account, my Instagram, and being extremely cautious about sharing personal information online. While the immediate threat from the creeper had been addressed, the trauma and anxiety it left in its wake were lasting. I constantly feared that my explicit content might resurface, damaging my reputation among friends and family. As time passed, I became more cautious and selective about my online presence. I focused on building a more secure and private digital life, prioritizing connections with friends and family over anonymous interactions with strangers. The experience taught me valuable lessons about setting personal boundaries, recognizing red flags, and understanding the potential risks involved in online interactions. It's essential to prioritize one's safety and well-being in the digital world, even if it means turning down opportunities for quick cash. In the end, I chose to walk away from the online content creation world, realizing that the cost to my mental and emotional health wasn't worth the financial gain. The Creeper's actions served as a stark reminder that some individuals can exploit and manipulate others online. And it's crucial to be vigilant and protect oneself from such threats. Thank you for sharing your stories and the important lessons you've learned. It's crucial to prioritize personal safety and be cautious when engaging with others online. Your experiences serve as a reminder to be vigilant and aware of potential risks. If anyone faces similar situations, it's essential to seek help and support when needed. If you ever need to share more stories or have any questions, feel free to reach out. Stay safe and take care.